Welcome back to our study of the Lord's Prayer. We are focusing today on the second petition of the Lord's Prayer, Your Kingdom Come. Now, last time we talked about the first petition, the first request of the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And we talked about what a privilege it is to call God Father, that that's something we get to do because of the gospel, because we've been adopted into God's family by grace through faith in Christ, that we have the privilege of calling God our Father. And we talked about what it means to pray, hallowed be your name. Though it sounds like a statement, it's actually a request. We're asking God to cause his name to be held holy or to be sanctified or to be honored, to be revered. We want him to be glorified, right? So um, that phrase held holy, I think I've read somewhere that's an excellent translation or an excellent paraphrase of what we mean. God cause your name to be hallowed. Let it be held holy. That's um, the first petition of the Lord's Prayer. Now the second petition is your kingdom come. So we're praying to our Father, we're praying to God and saying, God, we want you to cause your kingdom to come. Now, in order to understand what we're praying when we say that, we need to know what the kingdom of God is. In one sense, in order to grasp the Bible's teaching about the kingdom of God, we would need to study uh, all of the New Testament and really all of the Old Testament as well. But we can summarize the idea of the kingdom of God this way. And this is the best way I've uh, read it, uh, summarized. This is something I came across, I think, quite some time back that has stuck with me. And, and it's simply this. The kingdom of God is God's saving reign. The kingdom of God is God coming to reign as king and save his people. Or another way to say that would be to say that the kingdom of God is God coming to reign for the good of his people. That's what we mean by the phrase, the kingdom of God. God is the king, and he comes to reign over his people for their good and for their salvation. Now, um, we can expand upon that a little bit, right? If we were to uh, study the parables of Jesus, often he teaches in those parables about the kingdom of God. He will say things like, to what shall we compare the kingdom of God? Or uh, the kingdom of God is like, and then he'll give a parable, give some sort of illustration or metaphor explaining what the kingdom of God is like. So there's a lot more that we could say about the kingdom of God if we went on an extended uh, study tour, so to speak, of Jesus's parables. Um, but we also could go back to the Old Testament because the idea of the kingdom of God is not something that's new in the New Testament, right? In fact, Jesus shows up in, at the beginning of his ministry in, the, in uh, Matthew chapter 4, for example, in verse 17, and he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, he says that as though the people he's speaking to know exactly what the kingdom of heaven is. He doesn't show up and say, hey, I want to tell you about something. It's called the kingdom of heaven. You've probably never heard of it before, but you need to know about it. No, he says, hey, the kingdom of heaven is here. It implies you've been waiting, or is near. It implies you've been waiting for it, and I'm telling you it's really close, and so you need to repent. You need to get ready. You need to turn back to the Lord. You turn back to God. Turn from your sin, because God's saving reign has come near to you. He assumes that they know what it is. Why does he assume that they know what it is? Well, he assumes that they know what it is because the kingdom of God, the idea of the kingdom of God, goes all the way back to the Old Testament. We could probably trace it all the way back to the Garden of Eden, but let's just go back as far as the promise to David. Remember, David was the king over Israel, and God promised David in 2 Samuel 7 that God would put one of his sons on his throne and establish his kingdom forever. Isaiah, the prophet, picks up on that promise and expands it a little bit, right? Elaborates on it a little bit in a passage that's very familiar to us, but that we might not have ever thought much about in connection with the kingdom of God. 
In Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, he says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Right? That, we know this passage from Scripture readings at Christmas, right? But listen for the kingdom language here. To us a son is given, and the government, kingdom, the authority, the rule, shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this, Isaiah says. So Isaiah speaks about a child who's going to be born, who is going to have the government upon his shoulder, and his government is going to increase with no end. And with the increase of his government, there will also be an increase of peace that has no end. He will reign on the throne of David and over the kingdom of David. And he will establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth, Isaiah says, and forevermore. That is a promise about the coming kingdom of God, the coming birth of a king who will sit on David's throne. And this is going to be not just David's kingdom, this is going to be God's kingdom. So, we see this idea, again, in the Old Testament and especially in the New Testament, but it has its roots in the Old Testament, of the kingdom of God, of God's saving reign, of God coming to reign as king and save his people. Now, why do we need to pray for God's kingdom to come? Right? Remember, this is a request. It is a petition. We are asking God to cause his kingdom to come. We mentioned last time that there are six requests in the Lord's Prayer, three that are mainly about God and three that are mainly about us. Us. The first one is for God's name to be honored. The second one is for God's kingdom to come. So this is a request. What And we know what we're asking for now. Right? We're asking for God to come and reign and save. Right? That's what we're asking God to do. Now, Hasn't the kingdom of God already come? Didn't Jesus say, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand? He said it was near. So hasn't it come by now? Well, yes, it has. Jesus not only said at the beginning of his ministry, the kingdom of God is at hand, the kingdom of God is near, but in the midst of his ministry, he said the kingdom of God is here. Jesus in Matthew 12 was being accused of casting out demons by Beelzebul, the Prince of demons, Jesus was being, um, uh, there was, th in other words, these people were, were blaspheming, right? And here's what it says about Jesus and, and what he said in response to this. It says, knowing their thoughts, he said to them, listen to the kingdom language here, right? Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. And then listen to this. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of heaven has come upon you. Was it by the Spirit of God that Jesus cast out demons? Absolutely. What does that mean? That the kingdom of God has already come. And that shouldn't surprise us Right, If we know who Jesus is, Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus is the King of kings. Right, Jesus was born as king. Right, the, the, uh, the wise men came looking for him, asking, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Right, He's born in David's line to sit upon David's throne in fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. He is the king. And he is God, and he has come to save. And so in one sense, yes, the kingdom of God has already come, because Jesus has already come. But there is another sense in which the kingdom has not yet come in its fullness. And you won't be surprised to know, right, that the kingdom of God is going to come in its fullness when Jesus comes back. Jesus 
came the first time in his incarnation. He took on flesh and he brought the kingdom near. He brought the kingdom here. But after his death and resurrection, he ascended back into heaven. He's even now seated at God's right hand. He's interceding for us. And the Bible says quite plainly that one day he will return. And when he returns, he will bring the kingdom of God in all its fullness. This is why we are praying for the kingdom of, the kingdom of God to come. Because it has not yet come in its fullness. How do we know that? Well, let me point you to a couple of ways. One, in Matthew chapter 4, so this is just a couple of chapters before where Jesus is teaching us to pray for the kingdom to come. In Matthew 4, we already mentioned that in verse 17, Jesus said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was the beginning of his ministry. He's talking about the kingdom, telling people to get ready for it. And then, in verse 23 and 24 of Matthew 4, it says this, Jesus went throughout all Galilee, he, Jesus, went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. Now, what is going on there? Two things. Jesus is preaching about the kingdom, and Jesus is demonstrating the kingdom. Jesus is going through these villages preaching the good news of the kingdom. It is good news, it's gospel, that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that the kingdom of God has come nigh, because Jesus is here. That's good news. And with his preaching about the kingdom, he was also showing people what happens when the kingdom of God comes. What happens when the kingdom of God comes, God comes to reign, God comes to save, God comes to reign for the good of his people, what happens is sick people get healed. People get freed from demonic oppression. Right? Jesus, when he heals the sick, uh, heals those afflicted by diseases and pains, heals those oppressed by demons, etc. Even And when he raises the dead, all of those things, which isn't mentioned in this passage, but it's something else that he does, when Jesus does those things, he is giving people a living picture of what happens when the kingdom of God comes. Because when God himself comes to save his people, he not only forgives us of our sin, but ultimately he will also take away all the effects of sin, like disease and death. And certainly he will banish demonic powers, including Satan himself. And so when the kingdom of God comes in its fullness, what's it going to look like? It's going to look like Revelation 21 and 22. That is the ultimate description of the kingdom of God. When Jesus comes to reign, there's a new heavens and a new earth. And it says that there will be no more death, no more crying, no more mourning, no more pain. God will come to dwell with his people. And he will be our God, and we will be his people, and he will wipe every tear from our eyes, and we will see his face, and that is the fullness of the kingdom. So, two things to take away from this. One is to remember this, that Jesus teaches us to pray, not my kingdom come, but to pray to the Father and say, your kingdom come. I we're not asking for God to make everything happen the way we think it ought to happen, to remake the world the way we think it ought to be remade, to put us in charge. That's not what we're praying for, though that's sometimes what we think we want. It's not what we ought to want, and it's not what we're supposed to pray. We are supposed to pray for God's kingdom to come, for him to come and save, for him to come and reign, for him to come and set all things right. All right, so that's the first thing. Remember, when we pray, that we're not praying for our kingdom to come, but we're praying for God's kingdom to come. 
And the second thing is that we are praying in this prayer for God's kingdom to grow now and to come in all its fullness soon. Right? We are praying for the kingdom of God to grow, meaning we want more people to be saved by God, to bow their knee before Jesus as King and confess Him as Lord and trust Him and receive His salvation, receive His saving reign, become citizens of the kingdom of heaven even now. We want God's kingdom to come, in other words, in individual people's lives, right? Um, this I don't remember who I heard uh, explain it this way, but this is, this is right, right? That part of praying for the kingdom of God to come right, is praying for uh, it to come in individual people's lives, for individual people to bow to King Jesus and to trust him. So we want the kingdom of God to grow. Jesus talks about this, right, in at least one of his parables, right, how the kingdom of God seems small at first, seems insignificant at first, but it grows. How does it grow? It grows by people trusting Christ, bowing their knee to King Jesus, confessing him as Lord, becoming citizens of the kingdom of heaven. So we're praying for that as well as praying for the kingdom to come in its fullness, meaning praying for Jesus to come back and to set all things right. We want his kingdom to come because when his kingdom comes, disease is done away with, death is fully and forever defeated, is no more, and we get to live in his presence forever in a kingdom of righteousness and joy and peace. That's something we ought to easily be able to pray for eagerly. Amen, and come Lord Jesus.